and what your motto text is this year. So I'll announce the text while you're finding John chapter 8, if you're turning it up in your Bibles. And the motto text is part of John 8, verse the truth, and the truth will set you free. And I'm going to be preaching, God willing, on that in a few minutes. We're going to read from verse 21 of John 8 through to verse 36. It's a long discourse. We're taking the, the part of it that is particularly relevant around this text. This is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 8 and verse 21. So he, Jesus, said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of me is with me. He has not left me alone, for, uh, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these words, many believed in him, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, <coughs> You will become free? Jesus answered them, True, the does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. May God bless his word to us then. I hope this morning one great hope does indeed inspire us that we shall rise and live in heaven. I want to speak this morning from the motto text and use it as a, a springboard. Uh, but this is not taking a text, finding a text to pin my thoughts upon. It's really trying to expound what Jesus said in ways which the people who heard him first would certainly never have come to understand at the time and which we possibly don't fully understand either. And I'm not saying that I can say everything about what Jesus says in this marvellous promise. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What a promise it is. But what does it mean? And who is he speaking it to? Many people want freedom from many things. People want freedom from oppression or from poverty. Freedom from the law in the sense they want to do as they like. Freedom from fear. And some of these things, at least, people will try to wrongly put on Christ and say, that's what he came to do. He came to feed the hungry. Well, that's so we meant... That, that's what it means, freedom from poverty or freedom from oppression or whatever. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean freedom from the law. We're going to see what it does mean in a moment. And I want to divide this into three parts this morning, what I'm going to say, and each of those will be divided into three parts. Don't worry, you're not going to be here till 2 o'clock in the afternoon because I need my lunch as well. Um, they're, they're brief points. But we need to see, first of all, and this is sort of introductory, but it, it, we need to be clear how, how easy it is to, to misunderstand the word because we don't understand fundamentals sometimes. Who is speaking to whom about what? You know, you can take a text completely out of context, make it mean what you want it to mean. Let's look at the nature of this promise that Jesus made, because it is a promise, and three things about it. First of all, who is it to? Well, it's to Jesus' disciples. He says that clearly here in verse 31 of John 8. He said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. True disciples of Christ who abide in his word, who do his word, because they love his word, because they love him. 
Jesus said many times in John 14, in slightly different words, won't read them all out, that if you love me, you will obey my commandments, and that the person who doesn't obey my commandments doesn't love me. So this is real disciples. This is not just those who want to, to gain from Christ but not to give. Those who want to convert Christianity into something uh, that is uh, pleasing to them rather than be converted to Christ. Outward disciples, temporary believers. Look here in verse 31. These are the Jews Jesus is speaking to who believed in him. But as he went on to expound more things, you find by verse 59 that they are taking up stones to stone him. It's the same people. Their faith was purely temporary. Now, Jesus is making a great promise. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free to true disciples who abide in his word, who, who obey him. Let's be clear, we're not saved by obedience, but we are saved through faith. But faith is faith, as the Apostle Paul says, which works itself out in love, in love to Christ. And love to Christ is that which leads to obedience. So if you trust him, you love him, and if you trust him and love him, you will obey him. It's the same people. These are disciples. These are true Christians, true believers. So, Jesus speak, the, word is, the promise is given to Jesus' disciples. What is the promise about? What is this freedom? Well, it's freedom from sin. There it is in verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Go back to verse 21 where I began the reading. Jesus says, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Verse 24, he says, I told you you would die in your sin for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Verse 34, I say everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free from what? Free from the sin which you commit. It's clear, isn't it? This is the freedom that Jesus gives. This is the freedom that, that we find in the gospel. Not just, you notice, freedom from hell and from the punishment of sin, though that is gloriously true, we'll say more about that in a moment, but the gospel is not, as you could put it, a get-out-of-hell-free card, that you get, you, you'd get make some effort of, of belief <coughs> and you're given this thing and, and now you're safe forever. There's much more to it than that. We are not saved, we are saved from hell, but we're saved from hell, that's part of being saved set free from sin. It is from sin that Christ has set us free. As I hope we're going to see in a moment, there is much more to that than deliverance from eternal hell. Sin it is that separates us from God and leads to death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's sin that Christ came to set us free from. You shall call his name Jesus. We probably read that somewhere over Christmas, didn't we? The angel's words to Joseph, for what? He shall save his people from their sins. That is what we, Jesus promises to set us free from. And how? Third of these points under this first main heading. Through the truth you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, there's a lot of truth in the world. You may say there's a lot of falsehood, and so there is. But there's a lot of truth. Two twos of four is a truth. Uh, you could, I could give you all sorts of physical laws, uh, and they would be true. Uh, I could tell you lots of things. I could tell you yesterday's football results if I had them written in front of me, and they would be true. What is the truth that Jesus speaks of here? It's the truth, as the, the context makes clear, it's the truth about him. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth of who he is. He says that, that I am from above, and you are, uh, 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 but you're from below, verse 23. He says that unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sins, verse 24. It's the truth of Christ, the person and the work of Christ, gospel. The known gospel word, 
word, abided in. You must abide in my word, abide in the gospel. Christ himself indeed is the truth. I am the way, the truth and the life, he said. And therefore in verse 36, if the Son, who is the way, the truth and the life, sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free because he has died to reconcile sinners to God. There it is, verse 28 where he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he's talking about his death on the cross, to reconcile sinners to God through the truth of the fact that who he is and what he's done, believed in the soul. The truth does not save you if you don't believe it. But if you believe it, the truth brings you to salvation. We are saved through belief of the truth, through faith. As Jesus says, verse 24 here, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Implication, if you believe who I am and put your faith in me, then you won't die in your sins. You are set free by the Holy Spirit of truth who works in our souls and brings us to Christ. So, that's the first point, the nature of the promise that Jesus makes here. Second point, the present fulfilment of the promise. And that in three ways. There is a hymn, which I've already partly quoted, How sad our state by nature is, our sin, how dark it stains. And Satan keeps our is it foolish hearts slave in his slavish chains, something like that. Isaac Watts, and he, Isaac Watts is a genius. Sometimes he, he brings theology and it's every line is something true. He speaks there about three, deliver, three problems we have with sin. That we're in a sad state by it because we're under the condemnation of God. That it stains us deeply, that we are polluted by sin. And that Satan binds us in it, we're under the power of sin. We can put it like this, there are three P's. We are under the penalty of sin, we are polluted by sin, and we are under the power of sin. And from that all, Christ comes to deliver us. Let's look at these three P's. Let's start with the pollution of sin. Here in verse 44, Jesus says, we didn't read on that far, uh, to these Jews who are opposing him, you are of the father, your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He speaks about the fact that here are people who think, I'm righteous, I'm fine. And Jesus says, in God's holy sight, we are all polluted. And we need to be delivered from this pollution. And the scripture tells us how it is. It is indeed through Christ and through belief in the truth. It is, as it's said, in, he, in uh, Paul writes to Titus in Titus 3, and he says, uh, there of ourselves we were once foolish. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to how we were polluted. Foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. God look on that, looks on that in the heart and, and he, he sees someone who is completely in, unfit to be in his holy presence. But Paul goes on, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. A Trinitarian salvation, you notice. The Father pouring out the renewal of the Holy Spirit through Christ the Saviour, applying his work, and we are born again, and we are not now considered polluted in the sight of God. We are still sinners. But the Holy God can look on us with pleasure in his son. And then we are freed from the penalty of sin. You see again, here it is, Jesus says, verse 34, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, the slave does not remain in the house forever, 
Or there it was in verse 24, where he says, unless you, I told you, you would die in your sins. It's been said often and truly that the Lord Jesus Christ is the person who spoke about hell more than anyone else. He is the one who comes to set us free from the penalty of sin. In God's righteous sight, we are all guilty. Death separates us from God's grace, but not from his wrath. Verse 51, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Implication uh, is, if you don't keep his word, you will see eternal death. And Christ certainly does come to deliver us from hell as we trust in him. We are saved, we are delivered through faith, we are justified by faith. I quoted from Paul in Titus, but he goes on in the next verse to say uh, that so, be, having been saved by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, being justified, declared righteous by God's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He says that's what God has done. We are sinners and we are not only polluted in God's holy sight, we are guilty in God's righteous sight. But God declares us righteous. He justifies us in Christ. When we are in Christ, the righteous one, God declares us righteous. And so we become, as Paul says to Titus, heirs of life. We are set free from hell. We are going to be brought to heaven. Paul puts it like this in Romans 5. And verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified, declared righteous, by faith we have peace with God, reconciliation, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has come to set us free and the promise is sure. If we trust in him, we know the truth. The truth sets us free from the pollution of sin, from the penalty of sin, and yes, from the power of sin. Here it is again, verse 34. Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Truly, truly, Jesus says. He said he's really emphatic, isn't he here? He is in other places, but he is here. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. He says, don't just think of sin as being sins, as being acts which you commit occasionally. That I'm, more, I'm a good person, but occasionally I lapse. He says, if you ever commit sin, it's because you're a slave to sin. We are, as the scripture calls us, rebels against God, Romans 5 and verse 10. Verse 44, Jesus says here, you are of your father the devil, and you will do your father's desires. And therefore in verse 37, I know you are offspring of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Here were upright people in, in their sight and in everyone else's sight. And Jesus looks at the heart. And he says, but you, what are you doing? How are you going to respond to my words? You're going to kill me. You're going to try to kill me. And they did. Each one of us has our sins. Each one of us is a slave to sin. To the inability to love and serve the living God in the way that we ought to do. There are no nice people in God's pure sight. God's holy, righteous sight, God's true sight. We are all under sin. That's what we're told. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Christ comes to set us free. As another hymn writer says, he breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. Where sin is cancelled, by the application of his death on the cross so that we are delivered and we are considered righteous in God's sight, there also, in those very same souls, the power of sin is broken by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. 
not doesn't mean that we suddenly become perfect, does it? It doesn't mean we never sin. It means it no longer controls us. It means that we can be exhorted in the way that Paul does in Romans 6 because it's possible for us by God's grace to do this. Romans 6 verse 11, he says, So you must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So do not therefore let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. That is us. Set free from the controlling power of sin to love and serve the living God. Now do we see something then of what Jesus means when he says he will set us free? Free from the pollution and the penalty and the power of sin. If you're a Christian, those three things are true of you. And rejoice then that they're true of you. But there's more, and that's the third point. Because there is a future fulfilment of this promise too. And again, we have three more P's. And I don't think I, I've been fiddling this. Three other things that we're set free from. Not yet. But it's all part of the same. The salvation we have is not yet complete. We have been saved by a complete finished work of Christ on the cross. We are being saved, kept safe and indeed sanctified and made more like Christ. But there is a one day we will be saved. One day we shall be delivered from three more aspects of sin, beginning here with P. First, freedom from the practice of sin. You remember how John puts it in his first letter, 1 John 3 and verse 2, where he says, he's speaking of the coming of Christ, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. You see, we haven't got there yet. What will we be like? Well, we know that when he appears, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We shall be like Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is the eternal, holy Son of God who always has been perfectly free from sin. In his life, he went about doing good. He could say, I, Father is always with me because I always do what pleases him. He was sinless. He is sinless. He will always be sinless. And if we become like him, then it means we are made sinless. As a hymn writer again says, then we shall see, as Isaac Watts again, isn't it? Then we shall see his face. And never, never sin. And from the riches of his grace drink endless pleasures in. We shall see his face and be made like him, so we will be unable to sin. Another hymn writer. All are safely gathered in, looking at that final harvest. Free from sorrow, free from sin. This is absolute truth, isn't it? There will come a day when you and I, if we're Christians will be in a place and a state where we, it will be impossible for us to sin, as impossible as it was for the Lord Jesus Christ to sin. Now that is impossible to imagine. But it's worth much contemplation. There are, and when I use this word, sometimes people start thinking, uh, uh, yeah, that doesn't sound very Protestant. Uh, but I talk about, and it's not me at home by any means, the theologians do, spiritual exercises. That is, things, not spiritual disciplines like prayer and worship, but spiritual exercises. Things where there are things that you should do to, to exercise your soul. And one thing to do is to contemplate what it's going to be like in glory in a new heaven and a new earth. And part of that is to try and think, what would it be like if I were perfect? What wouldn't I do? Well, uh, it helps because you can apply that. Well, then I shouldn't do it now. John goes on. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Think about 
what sin is there in your life and that you'll be free from it and say, well, praise God, but help me, Lord, to be free from it now. And if you're going to do that, why not start now? Not New Year resolution, but here we are, first day of New Year. If you're not going to do that in 2023, when are you going to do it? 2024, 2025? No. Much about what it would be like to be sinless. Free from the practice of sin. Because that's what you will be. That's what God has saved you to be. That is his purpose. That's what he wants to make you. Sons, daughters of God, just like Christ. And he will. You will be free from the practice of sin. But there's more. There has to be more. You will also be, secondly, free. We will be free from the presence of sin. You see, that's the problem, isn't it? It's sometimes it's not just that we sin. Everybody else does as well. The Lord Jesus Christ was sinless, walked through this world. He, he hid himself in obscurity, came at 30 to start his ministry. Three and a half years later, they nailed him to a cross because they could not bear sin, the sinless one. And, and those were years of grief to Christ. And it would be grief to us to be sinless in a place where there is sin around us. But in heaven, it won't be like that in the new creation. Even Job, as it were, uh, in the scripture says, There the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. That, that, that's the hope of God's people through the ages, isn't it? To be delivered from the presence of sin. In Revelation, it's put like this, Revelation 21. And verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. You can mourn and cry about your own sins, but being free from mourning and crying and pain, because there's nobody sinning around you, nobody inflicting anything. Just try and imagine that. Just try, let's keep it uh, as, you know, to, to realms of possibility of, of thought. Just imagine, we're not going to be the only people in heaven. Uh, some churches, they think they are, but we don't. Uh, us here, but just imagine us here, believers here, who we, who we, who we meet with one week by week, and, and, you, and we, we, we know love, and we show love. But just imagine if you came in every week, uh, because we're starting you small here <laughs> with the imagination. Uh, only once a week, uh, only for an hour, and you come in and you don't sin and nor does anyone sin to you and everything. It's a perfect situation of complete and total love that you are in. And you say, oh, I'd, I'd be more likely to come to church then. <laughs> I'd feel more like it. But then expand it for all eternity to everyone and in the presence of God who is love and you begin to understand something. Again, it's impossible to imagine a holy world of love but that's where we're going to be. That's what Christ has come to bring us to. Isn't that amazing? We are rebel, guilty, filthy, polluted sinners and he is going to bring us to a place where not only don't we don't sin, but no one sins against us. I know this all sounds negative. It is mostly negatives, but you've got to, the positives are even harder to imagine, aren't they? Everybody just loving you. Unreservedly. Without effort. Including God himself. That's what it means. will mean to be free from sin. The freedom that Christ came to give. And thirdly, there is another P. Freedom from the possibility of sin. Freedom from this glorious state which I've been describing, ending. Because there it is, you see, in Revelation 22 and verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed or any curse. There it is. Revelation 21, it's a new heaven and a new earth. And God says, behold, I am making all things new, verse 5. No possibility of a repeat of what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. 
No fresh fall is possible because there'll be no more temptation to fall. No more temptation from within. James says when you fall, it's because you're tempted from within when you sin. But we would be perfect like Christ, so we cannot fall into sin by our own wicked heart. No temptation from Satan, for he will be in the lake of fire, Revelation 20 and verse 10. No temptation from the world, for the world and all that is in it will have passed away, 1 John 2 verse 17. God has made all things new. And so there is no possibility of this glorious state of being free from the practice and the presence of sin in a holy world of love, there's no possibility of that ever ending for all eternity. We will be set free from the practice, the presence and the possibility of sin. Is that what we want? Then we shall be free indeed. Yes, it's mostly negative. But we are positive that I've brought out. But it's positively we shall be set free to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Perfectly we shall see his face. His name will be on our forehead. We will reign with him forever and ever. We will, our servants, his servants will serve him. God will be present with us. He will dwell with us. We will be his people and he will be our God. In all the totality of the glory of that. Is that what you want? If I can quote one more hymn writer who says as he contemplates the return of Christ the archangel's voice God's trumpet sound will echo all the world around rise from the dark and gloomy grave the Lord has come to judge to save O oh Lord to this our hearts aspire this earth when earth shall perish in the fire new heavens new earth shall fill our gaze. No sin, no death, but love and praise. Do you aspire to that? Is that your hope? Not for what will happen in 2023, but well, who knows when, but it will come to pass. And if so, then, as John says, and we've quoted already, the one who has this hope purifies himself. Put sin to death, then. If you're so wanting to be free from sin, if you're so glad for the, part, for the partial freedom you have and the total freedom you will have from sin, then put sin to death in your own life. It's a whole package, isn't it? You can't just pick bits out of this. You can't pick out the raisins and throw the rest away. It is a full, total, eternal freedom from sin that the Lord Jesus in God's infinite love and grace has come to give you. It's all through Christ. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you.